Hello, everyone, and welcome back, or welcome for the first time, to Rewind, the Shenzhen Retrospective Film Series, which is a co-production of Stanford Libraries and the Toby Center for Jewish Studies. I'm Shana Hammerman. I'm the Associate Director of Jewish Studies here at Stanford. And this year, the Rewind series explores the themes of creation and the creative process. And I just want to acknowledge our great fortune to have the luxury to think carefully about creativity. Um, but then I was also thinking that creating art and then talking and thinking about it meets a kind of human need. Um, and I'm so glad that we can explore that today. Um, so I'm very pleased and honored to introduce Maddie Lipchansky, a cartoonist and illustrator who lives in Queens. Uh, they were the associate editor of the Ignatz and Eisner winning publication, The Nib. They're the author of the Antifa Super Soldier Cookbook and most recently Boys Weekend. And their next graphic novel will be out from Pantheon Books in 2025. Also, uh, Eitan Kensky, the Reinhardt family curator of Judaica and Hebraica at Stanford Libraries, is the founding father of the Rewind series. Eitan has a keen interest in how American Jews tell their stories through both film and comics. And today's conversation is an intersection between those things. Um, and I will say uh, to all of you here, stay tuned because there will be more Rewind uh, in the spring. So now, uh, please take it away, Maddie. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk about uh, these two movies today. Um, so I guess we'll start talking about American Splendor. Um, for those who, just a little background on the movie. Um, it's uh, it, was, it came out in 2003 by Sherry Springer Berman and Robert Polcini, who were originally documentary filmmakers. And it's this kind of hybrid movie where it's, it's a biopic, but it's not really a biopic. It's a documentary, but it's not really a documentary. Uh, and it's set between like 75 and 94. And it follows Paul Giamatti, who is kind of on the brink of starting himself uh, as indie comics legend Harvey Picar from his humble beginnings as a file clerk at a VA hospital through the publication of um, him and his wife Joyce's uh, acclaimed memoir, Our Cancer Year. Um, we see Harvey, who's like a loser going nowhere. And this very like dingy, dingily rendered Cleveland that I love. Um, they, they, he has a messy divorce and he makes friends in the art scene and he stumbles across his generational talent. He goes, he finds love, he goes through cancer, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and it's like very, it sounds like from a synopsis like this, that it's such a standard biopic, but it's, it's so much more than that. I think um, like it hits the beats um, in a way that's very different. Um, the movie's narrated by Picar himself <clears throat> who died, I think like seven years after this came out. Um, and it's interspersed with, the real life Harvey reacting to what's on screen and even some of like his real friends from real life just sort of wandering in. Um, some background on Picar, if you're not familiar with him outside of the movie. Um, he was born into a family of like, of uh, like of Polish Jewish immigrants uh, in 1939 in Cleveland. Um, his first language was actually Yiddish and his father, in addition to owning a grocery store, uh, was a, a Talmudic scholar. Um, after a brief stint in the Navy, um, he took the file clerk job that we start we see with him at the beginning of the movie. Um, and he, he struck up a friendship with uh, R. Crumb, Robert Crumb of Fritz the Cat, who's a legendary, if um, sort of problematic cartoonist who was working in Cleveland at the time um, as an illustrator at a greeting card company. This is before he went to San Francisco and basically started <clears throat> the underground comic scene, if you know it. Um, or was one of the foundational people of that at the time. Um, and then Picar started writing these books that Crumb drew by drawing these like stick figures. Um, and I, th I think what's what, what can't be really overstated um, is how revolutionary it was at the time to make comics about regular stuff and regular people that wasn't A for kids, uh, B superheroes, but also crucially at the time, it wasn't just Superman and Batman, which is, it, there's, it was mostly like horror and mystery and crime and all these like very, um, what was considered like de classe stuff. And so for him to do like liter almost literary day in the life nonfiction stuff was was really different. Um, comics for adults and nonfiction comics period were very much in their like extreme nascency in terms of what was getting mainstream attention. Um, you know, um, I think what's uh, interesting about Picard being in the movie is, you know, they were, uh, Springer and Pulcini uh, were 
the directors were when they were first researching the material, they said they were struggling with how to incorporate like this shifting nature of the character of Harvey in the books uh, because he was always drawn by different artists and he was always sort of commentating, commentating, commenting on his own actions from sort of like beyond the page. Um, and they and when they met the real life Picar, it was like, oh, never mind, we just put him in the movie because he's such a fascinating guy. Um, and the result is a sort of like blend of styles that really that captures the the spirit of the comics, I think, really well. Um, when I first encountered this movie, it was right when it came out in 2003. And I, I was doing a lot of digging, uh, but my recollection was that it was like an HBO original and it was conceived as such, I think, but it did get a theatrical release. Um, but it was my personal introduction to Picar um, and as like a superhero obsessed comics or a superhero averse rather comics obsessive myself uh i was really just totally taken with it um and when they asked me to introduce this i was a little scared because you know you see a movie when you're 18 and you are there any holes in this whatever uh but i was really pleasantly surprised and i love the blending of the two styles um you know and the, there are attempts of sort of varying clunkiness and success of introducing the language of comics into the visual language of the film um in a way that i think sort of before all movies were comic books. Um, a lot of movies sort of at the time were sort of struggling to do. Um, what I do like a lot is it, it lavishes a lot of love on like individual panels of comics when it shows the actual work being created. Um, as someone who writes and draws these things, you know, I very much appreciated the amount of time and attention given to the visuals that, you know, are all too often read at a speed sort of undeserving of care, the amount of care that goes into them. Um, and the, the nature of creation, I think, is, is, is of comics is represented well here. Um, you know, they're a grind and they're hard. Um, and they're some of the most rewarding art you can make, I think. And I think uniquely to comics, the sort of, and nonfiction comics, the sort of transmutation of oneself into one's art is really on display. Uh, like when we meet Harvey, uh, he literally does not have a voice and we watch him find it. Um, we also spend a lot of time watching him reckon with like what finding that the creative voice means and, and once the powers that be see him uh that they can make a buck off of him and his friends but they tend to bristle when he speaks out about issues that matter to him um this really resonated with me and the current time as well uh you know specifically for a lot of reasons but also as a very outspoken political person but also as a trans person you know the people with money want the clout of someone considered an outsider uh, but they care very little about what you're what we're trying to say a lot of the time um there's a great scene where he appears on you know he goes on letterman um and he's sort of the butt of jokes there um but he's he gets a lot of notoriety from it and then he's in public later harvey and um someone approaches him and says oh i love you on dave letterman and harvey asks the guy if he's read any of his comics and the guy just sort of laughs and walks away and says like oh that's great um i think a lot of artists today who uh, go to conventions or whatever, uh, they could tell you an almost identical interaction they've had with people responding to like stuff about our online brands, right? Versus who's actually engaging with the work on the level that we're intending it to be. Um, and the act of like branding and the creation of art uh, being basically as disparate now as they were then, you know. Um, another thing, inter interesting thing about this movie to me was the, the Jewish character, which is sort of undeniable. Uh, not just the setting, you know, Cleveland is a, a big thriving Jewish immigrant population at the time, uh, but and occupies a prominent place in the very Jewish history of comic books, right? You know, Siegel and Schuster, who made Superman are from there. Um, you know, and, and Picar is uh, by his own definition a, a Yid, you know, he's, even though he's not religious, uh, it's clear that his work is very suffused with this, I would say, very specific y Yiddish point of view. Uh, and, and it comes through in the tone of the movie. Uh, the, the first thing you see, right, is Harvey complaining to his doctor. Uh, that he's got throat cancer and he's informed that he was just yelling too much um which i thought was really great uh you know in the way that he talks about his accomplishments i think also was very it was presented in this very ho-hum like self-deprecating like oh no big yeah, fair, no big deal kind of way um that felt very much um like i recognize that you know um we also wanted to talk a little bit about um frank tashlin's artists and models just from 1955 uh, I say Frank Tashlin, but it's really basically a Martin and Lewis movie. It's their 14th 
and third to last film they made together. Uh, you can kind of tell them getting sick of each other, which I think was funny. Um, and, you know, Martin plays the guy he always plays in a suave ladies' man. And uh, Jerry Lewis is like a horny, but sort of like sexless man child. Um, and this one, they're roommates and childhood friends. Um, and Martin's like a struggling painter. And Lewis wants to make children's books, but is also a comic book obsessive. And it turns out their upstairs neighbor uh, draws the comic he's obsessed with called The Bat Lady, um, who's the model for Bat Lady, is a, a very young Shirley MacLaine, I think, one of her very first movies, second ever. Um, is the model for the Bat Lady and the roommate of the comic artist who draws her. Um, you know, um, the, the the plot is so convoluted. It's like a lot of these screwball comedies where it just takes a lot of, it's sort of not really pertinent to what the movie's about or anything. We get um, singing and dancing, physical comedy, spycraft, you know. Um, there's great late appearances in the movie by Ava Gabor and my personal favorite maybe in the world oh it's that guy with the face uh jack elam with the big guy um if you've never watched um rancho notorious i really recommend it um the the, the highlight at the end for me is this big technicolor dance scene at the artists and models ball um which is like a real crazy showstopper to me and i was just kind of marveling at the amount of color they got on the screen which we don't do anymore for some reason um you know, Tashlin, I think it's important to talk about here with his sensibility is that he was, before he was this live action comedy director, he was, he had a comic strip by himself and he was a, he was an animation director and he worked for uh, Fleischer and he worked for a Works and he worked for Disney and he worked for Warner Brothers. Like he, if you've ever seen the Bugs Bunny Elmer Fudge short hair remover, that's his. Um, and I think that like sort of Looney Tunes sensibility is all over that movie. Um, and, um, you know, like the first, the opening scene is this incredible Looney Tune gag. Um, but, and even like the, it might be a chicken and egg thing, but, you know, really even like the premise of these Martin Lewis movies is very cartoony to me, right? Like they're these two archetypal characters and then we drop them into X situation and see what happens, right? Um, and I think similarly functioning in that mode, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the movie engages with the, making of comic art not too seriously um there does have a great fascinating bit about sort of um the conception at the time that comics were again violent and gory for kids but also like dangerous for kids to be reading um you know this came out a year after the comics code authority was founded um which is a very haze code like sort of organization for comics um to recommend some further reading. There's a book called The Ten Cent Plague by David Haydu. It's about all that, which is a great book. Um, yeah, I will Yeah, I will say also, in my view as a person that makes comics, uh, the film doesn't seem super interested in how comics were made at the time. You basically see it as the output of like a single artist just sort of doing it front to back um, and not like the sort of conveyor belt method that was popular at the superhero publishers at the time, but, you know, I think we're meant to sit back and enjoy the show on that one a little bit. Um, speaking about like the two movies sort of in conversation with each other now, before I wrap this up, we start talking. Um, I'd say the Jewish character of both is, is interesting to think about. You know, Jerry Lewis, who's born, obviously, Joseph Levitch, I think. Uh, you know, we're very familiar with how Hollywood treated Jews at the time. Um, and the Martin and Lewis movies are not like outwardly Jewish in any real respect. But what is, you know, what is Lewis's character of not Borscht Belt shtick? Um, American animation, right, has its roots in that same kind of shtick, as well as, unfortunately, uh, minstrelry, which is a thing uh, to not talk about right now. Um, but you can argue, you know, uh, you compare that with American Splendor, which wears its Jewishness right on its sleeve. Um, again, despite P. Carnot being particularly observant, I think it's an interesting sort of comparison between the two times of of comics and movies and how things change in such a short period um and the way in the way the two movies talk about creativity i think is also worth noting you know i think that's what we're more here to talk about today right in american splendor it's creativity right it's this thing that grows out of the cracks of the concrete right uh and it's something that's found by accident and it's through collaboration and taking risks risks and it feels so honest to me like you know, you get 
creative by making art, not the other way around. And I feel that really strongly. Um, and artists and models, uh, which was produced under the Hayes Code, you know, much like the Comics Code, uh, depicts, I think, a little bit of a bleaker time uh, where things were more controlled top down, especially in art and movies. Um, but both, I think, at least present a time when it was uh, certainly easier to be an artist uh, and at least more uh, lucrative. Um, but anyways, yeah, so that's the two movies. Uh, it's on, I'm ready to go with our conversation, I think, whenever you're ready. Maddie Lipchansky, thank you so much for coming today and for sharing your thoughts on American Splendor and Artists and Models with us. You, yeah. you touched upon a lot of things that I want to talk about in more detail as we go. Right. Uh, and I think that there, and I, I'm going to concentrate mostly on American Splendor because, uh, you know, we put Paul on the on the, on the poster. Um, <laughs> this is not part of a stealth campaign to get him a best actor. It just happens to be uh, overlapping with the peak of the Paul Giamatti season. Um, you know, there are a lot of different ways I think that we could start talking about this movie, some of which you've already mentioned, right? And frames that we can use to unpack. We can talk about it as a biopic, as an adaptation, as a star turn for Paul Giamatti, as comic book movie in the era where that meant Crumb, Ghost World, Art School Confidential, and not all of the Marvel movies. You know, but before we mo go more in depth in the movie itself, you know, I wanted to ask you broadly about comics as an autobiographical medium. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you specifically about American Splendor is that you're someone who consistently draws themselves into their comics, who's explored district, different aspects of your life through comic strips and graphic novels. So what do you think makes comics work as an autobiographical medium? You know, what does it convey that other media do not? And, and maybe actually we could go in the other direction. You know, is comics actually a bad medium for autobiography? Um, you know, does it mislead in ways that other media do not? Oh, that's oh, that's an interesting thought. So, first of all, I think I do agree that comics is a good medium for for autobio. It's actually, you know, some people I saw even the other day online arguing about this that it was basically probably the most mature form of American comics operating right now in the sort of like graphic novel spaces, autobio stuff. You could see it's like the most successful adult comics certainly at the moment, um, and I think that's because. There's the, the, the thing about comics generally that I think are so great for in terms of like where I'm operating from in the sort of like indie comic space and also coming from a place of like, I do everything. I write it, I draw it, I color it, I ink it. It's all me, um, which is, I think, a pretty standard practice for the sort of circles I run in and the kind of work that I make. Um, but I, th I think what's what makes it so good for people like that is that it's such an accessible art form. It's so easy to get started doing. I mean, you watch the movie and it's funny that it's presented like it's this novel crazy thing that Harvey is like drawing stick figures and giving it to his friend to draw. And I'm just like, he's just thumbnailing. That's just mm -hmm. a normal step of the process. Um, that's how, a lot, I mean, I don't write that way, but a, a lot of people do. Um, and so, you know, anyone can draw a comic, right? It doesn't have to be the best art in the world. You know, I'm not, a classically trained artist i just started doing it and you do it long enough until you know the language of it enough to convey what you're trying to do um so to me you know i, th I think it works so well as auto bio or you know auto fiction whatever you want to do with it um because it's so accessible and it's so easy to just put yourself around on the page and just be in complete control of everything the readers seeing doing um you know, what have you, and you know, and, and does it mislead people? I don't think so. I mean, no more than uh, prose would, because you're just, you know, you're in control of the flow of information, but I think comics, you can convey so much information so fast that it's, um, it's just a natural advantage, I think, for telling a story. You know, sticking with this theme for a moment and then maybe moving back into the film, you know, one of the key questions that it raises that's related to autobiography is the self as character. And the kind of the danger of fictionalization, you know, yeah. we, we see it kind of most obviously <clears throat> when Harvey is talking to Joyce and she explains apprehension about meeting him because she doesn't know what to expect and what he's going to look like because of the different artists who've drawn him over the years. So do you think that the, the film kind of really goes and explores this really well and explores the process of fictionalization? Um, you know, what, where do you wish it maybe went deeper? And second, I, I'm curious if this is something that you think about with your own work. 
you know, is the conflation of artist and character something that you've intentionally sought out, or is it something you have to kind of repel against at times? Yeah, so I think, you know, I think uh, in the movie, there's really just that one line from Joyce, there's not too much else about it, which I thought was interesting, um, because there's all the stuff about his friends in the comic, right? And he's all just like, well, they loved it, and that's it. They love when they're in the comic book, you know, which might have been true for him. He, I don't, everybody's groups of friends and family are different. It was also a different time for what being famous meant or, you know, being known in books. Like it was, it's a lot easier to get hold of people these days. And I think a lot of people are more scared of maybe being portrayed in a way that they're not in control of. Um, and so I, I you know, on, on some level, I wish the movie had gotten into that more. Like I know the book started while he was still married to his second wife in real life and she was in the comics and they, got divorced so you know she must have not loved it uh i can imagine um so yeah I, you know and i think about my own work and the sort of so like i have a you know there's a couple of ways i depict myself on my work it's really all over the place but i have like you know i have a sort of like weekly comic that i do that gets goes on social media and on my patreon and stuff um that i've been doing since 2010 now i think it's a long time and I am often in that strip, um, but that's mostly, it is it is either one of two reasons I'm in those strips. It's one is um, I need someone to make fun of, and it's easy for me to be the sort of uh, moron in the strip because I can draw myself very quickly because I do it all the time. And I just need someone that can be the butt of a joke that isn't like, that you can tell that I, as the artist, am not like, here's a real person to go find and that I think is doing something wrong. Like it's, it's me. Right. Um, and then the other, the other instances, if I'm like making a comic about my own neuroses is just a shortcut to the, to the reader to let them know that I'm talking about myself and not some imagined person. Um, and then of course I've, I've done my, my, my graphic novel boys weekend that came out last year. It was like, sort of, it is based off. It is obviously a work of like science fiction. Um, but it is, the premise of it is um, based off something that actually happened to me, which was after I, I, I came out going to my friend's bachelor party uh, and having to be the best man in his wedding, despite not being a man. Uh, so there's a lot of um, myself that I put into that, but you know, the, I did, I did a lot of legwork there fictionalizing the people in the book um, to not be the actual people that are uh, friends of mine because I was, unlike Harvey, I guess, uh, sensitive to the fact that they might not like their portrayal. Um, and, you know, on some level, you have to sort of commend Harvey Picar for being, it's, I mean, it was quite courageous, right, to just put the people in his life there. Because um, there's really some, it's, you know, that could very easily get you some blowback. Um, there's a whole, you know, varying quality, but there's that, the whole, the Truman Capote show that's on right now is about how he did basically the same thing and it ruined his life. Um, you know, uh, so there's a lot of, it really depends on the situation, I think, but it's, uh, I don't think I could ever do that in my own work, really. You know, the film makes this claim that Harvey was the first to use comics in that confessional style. And you, you yeah. touched upon this, um, and to use it as a, as a space for exploring the quotidian, you know, and simultaneously also to build the exploration of the mundane around his own individual narrative voice. So I think it's implicitly it's setting Harvey's work as an outgrowth, I'm calling him Harvey like I know him, as an outgrowth of and reaction to the 60s comics and their preoccupations. Uh, I don't want you to react to that narrative and assess its historical accuracy unless you want to. What I want to ask rather, is it this mix that makes American Splendor Jewish? The conflation of the artist and the character is kind of a major trend of Jewish storytelling thinking of Philip Roth and his narrators, or Saul Bellow and his narrators, or Isaac Basheva Singer and his presence in his stories. And if I can yeah. mention this name aloud in polite company, Woody Allen as a character in his film, you know, is this, is it this mix, the everyday, the humor, the author is character, the ultimate, the creator is the ultimate nebbish, you know, that kind of makes it Jewish, or is American splendor Jewish simply because of biography and occasional content? Great question. Um, I think it's I think it's Jewish because of the way, you know, I, I think it's you you listed a bunch of Jewish authors just then, but I guess with the exception of Bishefa Singer, who was born in Poland, I think. But I would I would uh I would say he was Polish American, right? Um 
you know, I, I think, I think those, they're all very like uniquely American Jewish, mm-hmm. right? More than anything else, um, which again, I think is not all American Jews, obviously, but it is heavily Ashkenazi. Um, and I think, you know, there's something about the idea of, there's you know, there's obviously a very Jewish mode of telling a story, right? Like even people who are not the great storytellers of the, the Western canon, but we all got, you know, a grandfather or something who's like that and tells stories in that way. It's very, um, and I honestly, I can't tell you where it comes from. I'm not a scholar of, you know, you work at the Jewish studies department at Stanford, not me, but, you know, I think um, there's something so uniquely, like I said, like Yiddish about like the way that he is telling these, telling the story. And I think the idea that the, the fact that he is, you know, basically like the Shlemiel and the Shlazel and every story he tells, um, that feels what's really Jewish to me. Like, I don't think, like, I, like there's nothing about him, like the fact that he was born to a Jewish family, I don't think does that. I think it's, I think it's a sort of um, sensibility that's, that's all over it more than anything else. You mentioned, you know, his connection to Yiddish and Yiddishkeit, and and actually later in life he wrote a graphic novel, Yiddishkeit, <clears throat> that was kind of a personal history of Yiddish literary figures that have mattered to him. So this is someone who very much has a kind of cultural Judaism, however we want to we want to talk about it. Yeah. Um, and I think, I <clears throat> guess, what I'm wondering is that you know the movie, as you say, it kind of talks about voice and uses voice as this metaphor for the creative process. You know, we um, we it opens with him voiceless, uh, yeah. as, as you say. Um, his cadence then modulates, you know, kind of dramatically throughout the film in response to his anxiety, you know? So it, metaphorically, it serves to kind of go with the creative voice. But do you, but the voice also expresses itself in Jewish form, that there's this sort of Jewish presence there when he starts talking, that the moment when it kind of, the film's moment of saying it all clicks, is when he's standing in line at the grocery store behind the old Jewish woman and kind of saying, I, I, I'm a Yid, and, yeah. you know, but I still don't like this experience. So it is this kind of interjection of, of self, Jewish identity that kind of creates you know, this, this voice at that moment in the film. So I'm curious if you felt that this was a, you know, a strained memoir, you know, metaphor that the movie was giving us for creativity, you know, a way to kind of introduce something very unvisual, something you have to hear, you know, into a kind of visual comics medium, or if the notion of voice is really like powerful and compelling. Yeah. So I, I actually think the the notion of the, the notion of the voice was actually good for me because, you know, it's a, it is an adaptation, right? It is not, if I wanted just, the language of comics, I would read a comic book. Um, I'm such a strong proponent of an adaptation in any form, taking advantage of the strengths of the medium, right? And like what film and comics are both visual mediums, obviously, but like what movies have is sound and comics don't um, at present juncture. And um, as much as they tried to force motion comics down our throats uh, 15 years ago, I... You know, um, see, I'm losing my voice, which is... You're channeling you know, the film. You're kind of... I truly am. Um, you know, the... Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Jeez, hold on. You know, I, I think there's uh, something great about the way that he finds his voice. And it's, to me, not just saying, like, oh, I'm asserting my own Jewishness here. It's that, like I'm asserting myself. And I am a person who thinks like this because I am Jewish, right? Like, mm-hmm. it's all one big thing. So the idea of it sort of them finding this central thing, um, it makes a lot of sense to me. And I think it's, a, I think it's a, an interesting and like pretty good creative decision on the, on the filmmaker's part. I, I, I thought it worked. You mentioned the creative process and kind of how this movie actually resembles contemporary comic practice, or at least some people's practice. You know, we, yeah. we don't see him writing scripts. We see him just kind of drawing these thumbnails and crude, yeah. crude layouts. Um, but to your point, it, it really does seem to serve to say that, to emphasize what Harvey is not in order to find what he is, what is unique about it, not an artist, not a natural talent, you know, he's not an R crumb. So do you think that this is a compelling way of describing what comics d- 
does and the outlet it gives to people from a creative process? Does it seem realistic, amusing? Are you are there movies that you think do especially good job besides this of or maybe not this of you know kind of visualizing the process of making comics or ones that do an especially bad job? Yeah, um, let's see. So yeah, I think the first part of the question here about the sort of process and it's it's realism or not, you know, I think um, it wasn't like, you know, there's a bit where he's doing the book with, um, who drew our cancer here? I'm blanking on the name. Um, Frank, right? Or Fred, Fred. Fred, uh, anyways. Um, when he when, when he's working on the book together, they're just like in the same house all day. I was like, well, that's crazy. That's not how this would go. But um, I mean, that was the movie uh, we could talk about this later, doing the strangest thing it does, which was uh, change whose daughter it was. Um, like in real life, the the, the daughter they adopted was a, a musician friend mm. who was houseless and the daughter was in a bad situation and they adopted her. And then the movie, it's like, well, she's at my house today because this guy's drawing my comic book and then he left her here. And it's sort of it's the strangest thing in the movie that doesn't quite work for me. But um you know, I think, but the idea of, of, of but thinking about the the artistic process, right? Um, and the and what I was saying before about comics, how it is such a good, it is such a great way to tell stories because anyone can do it. Which I'm always saying this, like anyone can do it. Like anyone can sit down and make a comic. It doesn't have to look good. Doesn't matter. Um, and you get good by doing it. Um, and the, and the thing that I said before that you, I, I feel uh, that you get. You become creative by making things. You don't, it is not like some inherent magic inside of all of us that drives us to make things. You know, you could you could have the desire to make things, but the what makes you have ideas is making things. Um, you know, which is why I think I've been thinking about this a lot lately because of a lot of stuff with AI and the things people say about how, like, oh, this is great, because you can just you don't have to get good at art anymore. You can just you have your great idea and you write it down and it comes out visually the way you want it. Um, if you write the right sentence. Uh, but that's, you know, I think for me, it sort of elides the, the whole thing, which is the, the, the making of it makes you better at it or makes you, you know, it sort of generates the thing in you uh, just making things. Um, and I think the movie sort of shows that he just sits down one day, like, Oh, I should make a comic. Cause I know comics. He doesn't, it's not like he has great ideas for comics. He's just like, here are the comics that I can make. And then it turns into something great um, and notable. Um, so I, I thought that was really good. There's, you know, I, I'm trying to think of movies that depict comic artists. And I'm really, I'm really coming to blank. I think there's like uh, Chasing Amy, which is another yes, one, which is like, Amy. which is, is the same problem as artists and models. Or it's just kind of like a comic book page is when you sit down at your dra- your big drafting table and you draw Batman and it just sort of like Batman pours out of you. No, you draw the Bat Lady. Or the Bat Lady. <laughs> Beautiful Shirley MacLaine. Uh, but like, so, you know, these, like the way at the time, even now, the way like superhero comics work is it's like seven people and they do it in like crazy speed and you're just doing one thing. You're just lettering, you're just coloring. You're just inking, you're just penciling, you're just writing. It's not like, you know, um, it's a whole different process. And it's not like to depict that kind of comic making as like an autorish thing uh, is very unrealistic to me. Right. You know, so maybe since you brought up artists and models now, we'll ask a talk a little bit about this movie, uh, which I'm really curious um, what you think about actually. Um, So Rewind has always made an effort to organize our programs around kind of double features to think about movies and conversation. So this Frank Tashlin directed Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis film, Artists and Models is a kind of forerunner perhaps about comic fans and their creators. It's not exactly good, but I think there's interesting things throughout the the movie. And one of the things that I, I do think is worth talking about more is it seems to be playing with the themes of Frederick Wortham's Seduction of the Innocents and the uh, com- the contemporary reaction to comics at that moment. We even have the Jerry Lewis character appear as part of a testimony, you know, kind of inspired by the, the Wortham book. So, you know, Wortham had this understanding of the latent messages of comics, you know, as, as vehicles for transmitting homoeroticism, fetishism, causing arrested development. And the movie reacts to these interpretations by just literalizing them. 
you know, comics turn Jerry Lewis into this person who can no longer find a place in contemporary society. So my question to you is, you know, how do you as a critic and pr practitioner engage with a, with a text like Artists and Models now? You know, do you try to salvage these texts from the past and find the clever and subversive within? Is it better to name the elements it gets wrong and move aside? You know, I ask because we seem to be in this cultural moment when no one really knows what to do with our cultural legacy, uh, but also where we're dealing with the baggage of these past visions of comics still, and this is still some people's thought of, you know, this is who likes comics as an adult. Yeah, I mean, we still get once every two years, get a what we call in the biz a bang zoom comics aren't just for kids anymore article in the New York Times, you know. Um, and uh, I've, I've got the original drawing of the Michael Kupperman R comic serious literature comic over my desk, which I look at every day while I draw. Um, but, you know, I think um, as you're, you're thinking about the sort of like legacy of the movie and how to engage with it, you know, like you said, it's not a great movie. Um, the, the big takeaways for me yeah, are like sort of like, it looks great. It's more like, wow, we used to make movies that looked good, even crappy ones. Um, just the amount of care and craft that goes into the 14th Martin and Lewis movie, you know, um, was was kind of astounding. Uh, the sort of, yeah, the, the Looney Tunes-ness of it. I thought there was like four or five like really wonderful visual gags. Um, but the, the idea of, um, I think, the movie being a meta commentary on itself is actually the thing that I get really hung up on with it. Uh, that's that's interesting to me is the, yeah, the sort of like Hayes code comics code handshake going on in that movie where, yeah, it does literalize the sort of conception at the time where yeah, comics were both for children, but also dangerous for children. There's a bit where, um, you know, the, the woman that draws bat lady goes to the office and the guys met and the publishers mad at her. Because like, these are kids' books. Where's the blood? Um, and then, yeah, she later, when she's disillusioned with the comics industry, gets Jerry Lewis to go on TV and, you know, basically do, like, Dear Officer Krupke at the audience about how he can't do anything anymore. Um, but at the same time, uh, so, yeah, it, like, literalizes all this stuff that was in the, in the air uh, culturally about comics. But at the same time, this is a vehicle, the whole movie is Tashlin basically saying he's very horny for Shirley MacLaine in a bat costume. Like he has such an obsession with women in costumes and it's so obvious. Um, so it is this weird, like sort of backdoor thing where it's like the comics code comes for, to make comics more, accept, more, you know, uh, more appropriate for children and the readers and the Hayes code is here to make movies uh, wholesome and you know take all the subversive elements away from the the theater going public that's so impressionable but at the same time here's here's tashlin uh sneaking in all of his like basically what's like really close to like fetish wear yeah. on the screen um so I, I thought that was really uh fascinating in terms of like this movie is a cultural object yeah but again i think that's a moment where that's the criticism right that comics is presenting this stuff and this if you if you read the the seduction of the innocence it's actually striking because sometimes you're like well this is just a dude commentary and then you think oh the remedy you know wortham's remedy is get rid of comics and you're like i don't know if i agree with you there um so i i did want to keep asking about tashlin and, and comics and so forth because as you say he was a successful animator before he became a filmmaker and to me like as for you the move the moments that are most really resonant and the work the best are the ones that see him being visually dynamic using bright colors elaborate elaborate sets captivating bodies as you mentioned you know, he's not afraid of showcasing a woman's sexuality and kind of yeah. playing with what you can show at the time um i think uh it's one of his most famous movies is uh the girl can't help it with a young yeah. jane mansfield so this is something that he's aware of the the physicality you know but it's interesting to consider you know how that is connected to his past as an anim animator. And we think that comics, cartoons, animation, and movies should all go together because they're all visual media, but somehow they really don't actually fit quite frequently. Um, they're, what, they're, there's something that just goes wrong in the translation frequently. Um, and I, I wonder if you, as someone who's made comics, you know, have given thought to why this relationship can be so fraught. You know when the pairing works and makes sense, mm -hmm. and how is it you know that these two visual media connect when they really do? 
Yeah, that's that's interesting because you know I think as a as a person who draws comics all the time, people will just sort of assume that, like you say, you're a cartoonist. They assume you work for an for an animation studio, um, or people will refer to a drawing style as an animation style. I've seen that multiple times, um, which is you know to me crazy because it's pretty very by by its own nature very static, right? It's a completely different thing. You know, I think animated cartoons and movies have more to do with each other. You've definitely seen uh, a lot of people who who direct live action, direct animation with success and vice versa. Though, you know, every time you see um, like, oh, what is it? Uh, like the Lord Miller who did the Spider-Man movies, like they are the directors of those movies, but they're still, you watch the credits, there's an animation director that they got to bring in to make sure all the animation gets done correctly because you need someone with the technical knowledge of how animation works. Um, so I think it's important to keep these things like very distinct and they are their own mediums. And I think, but this is, you know, I think in artists and models, right? Like I think Tashlin grasps what you can do, uh, what, you know, there there's things that cartoons can do and there's things that movies can do, right? This is the same stuff I was talking about before in terms of like the strength of the medium. And you can do a big Looney Tunes thing, like the like the first scene of the movie uh, that I love, the weird gag with the billboard and the smoke and the money, um, or the comics getting blown out of the mouth of the lady. Like that's great stuff that works uh, live action. But I think there's a lot of like, you know, it's it's knowing what you can and cannot do um, is is the big is the big difference. And I think if you if you go into a comic thinking you are making a movie you're going to come out with a bad comic and you go into a, a movie thinking you're just going to like take the panels and put them on screen you make a really bad movie Zack snyder yeah that's exactly who i thought yeah. of when you uh when you said that i mean it's like and, and the, you know, it's very funny we were, we were, i was talking before about the language of comics in the movie and sort of like yeah like and then basically up until american splendor all the all the movies of comics we were seeing that were not the batman or superman movies really um were like yeah like ghost world or a movie or crumb or whatever um but i think it's this this movie came out the same year i think as ang lee's hulk mm -hmm. which is not a marvel movie in the traditional sense the traditional the way we think about marvel movies now but it but it does have all these like literal comic panels and gutters and stuff in it and does like meanwhile and like the comic text like it's very it was an interesting time where like directors didn't know what people wanted out of a, of a comic book movie, because I think the public would react strangely uh, depending on what what happened. But um, I <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> weirdly, I think the Angley Hulk is a pretty good movie uh, and gets short shrift. I know it's been kind of reclaimed. Have you have you always felt I, this way, or is this something that you've, I, you? Know, no, I to? I saw it in theaters and was kind of confounded by it, uh, and then I watched it again a couple of years ago, and I got a real like. Well, that don't make them like this anymore, you know. <laughs> it just it's got so much more going on than I think. It's just I've been served so much slop for the last ten years that I feel better about this older movie, you know. Um, but I think uh, what was I saying? Oh, but the sort of like <clears throat> yeah, I think I just think it's interesting to sort of like you can't just take comic panels and film them. That's not a movie. That's pictures of comic panels. Is yeah. my my point really? So why don't we come back to American Splendor to kind of, you know, wind down, you know, uh, one element that I noticed this time that I haven't really noticed before is that Harvey Picard is a collector of old records and yeah. old comics. And, and Steve Buscemi's character in Ghost World is also a collector. The Canadian comic artist Seth has written several books themed around collecting. Mm -hmm. It's a good oh, life yeah. if you don't weaken Wimbledon Green. Um, ben Catcher's entire oeuvre is also predicated on collecting and recovery. Am I just reacting to this as a, you know, as a curator and professional collector of things, or do you see a kind of more detailed and intimate connection between the acts of making comics and collecting physical traces of the past? Interesting. Um, you know, I think my answer, the first thing that came to mind for me is that I think most people I know that are creatives, we tend to hoard things. I don't know if it's, it's necessarily contained to comics. Um, I think there's something about comics that like nothing beats the physical medium and they are, and there's always been comics collecting as, you know, a sort of 
thing you can do to it's a thing you do with comics right you know you get them bagged and boarded you hang on to them you the the bins at a comic shop are really reminiscent of the bins at a record store it's a very mm-hmm. similar kind of experience of shopping if you're looking for like old stuff um you know but i think there's something about if you are a creative person so much of your life is like hoovering up as much information as you can but the world around you whether it be you know listening to people's conversations drawing people on the subway um just watching people um you know in the world for how they interact with each other um and then also just like absorbing as much um sort of stuff as you can like influences right like um I, I just i don't know a single creative person that isn't reading all the time isn't watching movies all the time isn't like sort of just you know, I hesitate to use the word consume because I don't think of it as consuming, but sort of like absorbing as, as much as I can all the time. And it's nice to be, you know, working in an office full of books is just nicer. I see you agree with me. It's just much, it's much nicer than um, working in a big empty room. I just want to be, you know, and I, and maybe, maybe there's something about comics that just like the, the physical tactical sense, tactile sensation of them is different. And maybe drives people to just have, I mean, I have a stupid record collection. I have a bunch of com- comic books in my house. Like you can barely, you can't see all the shelves in here, but like, um, That's yeah, part two. I, you'll I, take us on the room tour. Yeah. I'm going to lift up my, my desktop computer and, <laughs> uh, you know, there's just a lot of, um, I think just a lot of creative people just want to have that stuff around. Yeah, I think that's right, but I, I and I, I know Shane has one or two audience questions that she's going to come on to read in a second. Um, but I think one of the things that struck me is when you say that you don't know creative, lots of creative people who aren't always engaging with other media, but a thing that I have noticed, I have a few, a number of friends who are comedy writers and write sitcoms or, and, and movies, and they never watch sitcoms. Um, they spend a lot of time writing these things, but they, they engage with wholly other texts. And I think, oh, perhaps the reason I can't write a sitcom is that I spend too much time watching them. So I'm curious if you think, you know, if collecting is also a way of exploring those creative energies and not having it tied into the contemporary moment so that your own responses can, your own response can be pure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a really great point. I mean, I personally, I'm the same way when I'm draw when I'm like penciling a book, I don't read comics um, because I don't want to be. I want to have my own ideas, right? I want to be sort of like a pure sort of generative space with it. Um, And yeah, I think the idea of like having the books around sort of makes me feel like I'm immersed in the thing, even if I'm not right now have the the comic cracked open because I'm working on a graphic novel. Like, you know, I, when the book comes out, I I can go like, like last summer was great. I was on book tour in comic book shops and I was just picking up everything I missed for the last year and a half, you know? Um, but sort of, um, yeah, I think I think the idea of just sort of being like immersed in a physical space of the thing uh, is is so is so powerful. Um, I'm like interrogating my own habits now. I've never thought about it in this way. That's a service we offer here. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if if Shana is gonna, I think she's having some internet issues, but uh, oh, there we are. Or there we were. Hi. Yes. Mm. Uh, so apologies if this dies again, but you know, mm. um, this was really great. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to encourage people if they have questions to put them into the Q and A tab. Um, and I'm going to ask my question first, which uh, I want to talk about that opening scene where we see young Harvey, um, you know, explicitly rejecting the superhero genre uh, and, and calling it stupid, even as a kid, who knows how, how sort of true that is, uh, whether it's a true memory. Um, and there's been a lot of scholarship written about and even fiction written about the Jewishness of the superhero genre. And you even located it in Cleveland as well. Um, and I'm wondering this this response to the superhero genre, the the rejection of it, is also explicitly Jewish or implicitly Jewish. Yeah. And so I, I'm wondering how to understand this as a kind of like intra-Jewish dialogue, 
about the best way to do this thing, however we want to define it, um, or uh, if this is a kind of Jewish rejection of, of, of one kind of Jewish thing, but it's not really um, a Jewish genre, you know, Crumb wasn't Jewish. Uh, so what what do you think about that? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, this is very much like in the in the comics, I got a rabbis, uh, Siegel and Schuster say this, and Rabbi Picar says this kind of thing. Uh, but you know, I um, that's it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very much like there are multiple ways to engage with one's own heritage, um, and I think I think it has more to do with when Picar comes of of age. <clears throat> rather, excuse me, when Picar is an adult, you know. Superheroes have been the dominant mode of comics for 40 years. Um, and I think it's more a reaction to that. And, you know, there are obviously uh, Jewish titans of auto bio and nonfiction underground comics with an X kind of stuff, you know, Picard, Spiegelman, what have you. But it is, um, it is less explicitly, I think, uh, as a I like you know there are lots of non-jews writing memoir or whatever but only a a jewish american could have come up with superman i think is the sort of difference there um and i think it's more with with picar and, and that sort of and those sort of comics it's about the sensibility of what he was doing being jewish and less about um the sort of like idea of a memoir comic being a specifically jewish thing um it might just be I see this I see this one Jewish thing and I want to argue with it, you know. It might have been as easy, simple as that. That's great. Thanks. I the and uh, so this next I don't know. If this is just sort of like I'm going to put something out there for you to riff on. I don't know how to make it a question. Okay. Um so we're talking about creation, creativity, and one of the dominant metaphors it's not even a metaphor for talking about creation is reproduction, right? Yeah. Having kids. And his the first thing he says, what's the, what's the wife's name? Joyce. 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 The first thing he says to her is, "Before we get into this, you know, I gotta." Me. Yeah. Um, so he's cutting that off as a potential sort of creative production um, for his personal life. But then there's this sort of accidental child that enters their world and kind of ties everything in a nice little bow at the end. I don't know if that's a kind of um, movie magic like a, a demand that audiences need to kind of make us feel okay. I mean, obviously it's also true. He had this daughter. Um, uh, or, or, or if, or if this is a, a comment on creative production and, and the way that her presence somehow helped in his own recovery and in uh, his wife's production, you know, like her work on the, the comic about his cancer. I don't know. What do you think? Um, yeah, that, that's interesting. I think uh, it's very funny, the thing with the vasectomy I wrote down and the sort of running uh, very Jewish things that occur in the movie, which is being too upfront about a medical issue uh, immediately to a person. Uh, but, you know, I think there's, like you said, there's something about, it does tie it up very nicely, but I think there's something about the, the central metaphors of the movie where, again, like his wife, Joyce was an important collaborator of his on many things um, in his life um, creatively and both just sort of him as like him as in quotes Harvey Picar was very much part like her thing. She was very much like the manager of his legacy. Um, I know, you know, if you tabled at indie comics conventions um, in the last 20 years, uh, you met her every year coming to your booth giving you a card because they were trying to get a Harvey Picar statue built in Cleveland. Um, and she was very much like, I am, I'm in charge of Harvey's legacy. This is, you know, so she was just an important part of his life so much. And I think much like the way that art is this accidental thing, um, you know, and I said in a complimentary way, it's like, you can't force it. It is a thing that you sort of, that, comes about through struggle and sort of like in unexpected ways. I think it's the same thing about his family in this instance, where it's just like, oh, another important collaborator of his sort of like, this wouldn't have happened if she wasn't around. And it turns out it was very fulfilling for him, something he thought he didn't want. Um, so I think it was just like a nice little echo of the same thing 
um and and maybe you know the, the movie made it yeah a little a little too neat too neat with the way that they acquired said daughter uh but i think uh in a decision that is still kind of puzzling to me but like um i think it was just like a nice little echo of reality mirroring um sort of like universal truth stuff you know so since you I were... did I did look up um the daughter on Twitter, whatever, Google, and she yeah. was Twitter. She hasn't done anything since 2015, but it it says her Twitter bio is Harvey Picar's ward. So the the kind of um the motivation of legacy that he actually addresses early on, like what are people gonna know about me? What is my life gonna mean when I'm gone? It sounds like these women in his life have. I don't know, intentionally or not, taken that legacy very seriously, um, and, and they it it continues, and it might have continued without them, but he, um, yeah, he 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 gets to live on through them, which is really kind of beautiful. Yeah. Maybe we'll close there by also just saying, you know, with this word legacy, you know, to put it bluntly, is Picard still influential? Um, is this still a resonant name for American comics creators? You know, Crumb is still Crumb. You know, the what crumb means is very contested, right? But sure, it sure is. But it's still a name and it's still the first name perhaps that people know when they think of independent comics. But is Picar still Picar or has that name kind of faded away? I mean, I I don't know if I'm the best to judge because I'm, you know, I'm pushing 40. I'm not a young cartoonist anymore. Um, but I, I mean, I certainly, I certainly think he's very important for the form if we're talking about auto bio comics in this way um that are sort of like about these little day-to-day -day things like it's just hard to imagine a comics landscape without these contributions um you know he was certainly by no means uh the first ever person to do comics about himself this way um he was not um he did not like invent the form but he did popularize it in a lot of people's minds um in the way that like you can't in any artistic movement, you can't just say like, oh, it's X person, it's Y person. Um, but I, I think it's hard to, you know, I think maybe today Spielman gets a little more credit um, because he was also drawing. Um, but I think in terms of like the idea that you can be a comics writer about this kind of stuff that just writes is, uh, it's hard to deny. I don't know. That's great. Thank you so much, Maddie Lipchansky, for being here with us today. Um, for people who are in the vicinities of Stanford Libraries, I will plug my colleague's a collection my colleague brought in, the Fowler Underground Comics Collection, which is a massive treasure trove of underground comics. Uh, obviously, we're not in San Francisco, but we're near enough by that we had people who were involved with this scene and interested in it for a long time. So please come check out the original comics. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah.